Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should be aware that this video contains the name of a person who has passed away, specifically around the 1720 mark. Hello and welcome. My name is David and I am here with another thrilling episode of Ozpol Explained, where I explain Australian politics to you, the person who wants to learn. Today we'll be talking about referendums. Referendum? More like referend fun. Let's begin. So first off, what is a referendum? In short, a referendum is where the country comes together to vote on changes to the wording of the constitution. In Australia, the wording of the constitution cannot be simply changed by the parliament. It must have a majority approval by the voting public. Voting in a referendum, just like a federal election, is compulsory. The constitution lays down the foundation of how a government works and what its legal powers are. And that's it. Thanks for watching. That's all you really need to know. No, please come back. I've got more. I spent a lot of time researching this. Please watch more. Many of you are actually probably too young to remember a referendum, but you do know of the word plebiscite. Let's quickly go into the difference between those two things. A plebiscite is similar to a referendum, but different. A plebiscite is a non-compulsory vote on a non-constitutional matter and is much, much rarer. You may be thinking about the time that we asked the whole country whether or not marriage equality should be a thing back in 2017. That wasn't a plebiscite. It was intended to be a plebiscite, but a plebiscite requires legislation to pass. Multiple plebiscite bills actually failed to pass in Parliament and so the government was really sneaky and they were like, hey, what if instead of like people voting, we just get the ABS or Australian Bureau of Statistics to sort of like have a postal survey and just ask everyone's opinion in a yes, no fashion, much like say a plumber site would. It was a non-compulsory postal survey. You know, like a plebiscite, but slow and inefficient and just actually technically legally different, but the same thing. Historical federal plebiscites have been on whether or not we should have conscription, which is where people are forced to fight in wars, in 1916 and then another one in 1917 because Billy Hughes couldn't take no for an answer. And then also we voted again on the national anthem in 1977. So there's varying degrees of importance there. Plebiscites are actually also non-binding and the introduction of a bill for a plebiscite doesn't actually have to specify what the government will do once the plebiscite passes. Whereas with a referendum, the exact change a government wants to make has to be detailed in that bill. There's a little bit of a controversy with that with the marriage equality postal survey because it was seen as an expensive opinion poll that the government could then just ignore because it wasn't binding. Thankfully though, they didn't. There have been many plebiscites on the state level, like whether or not to have daylight savings or, you know, trading hours for bars and shopping centers. They are far more common than federal plebiscites. So how do referendums actually happen? Well, the rules regarding referendums are outlined in section 128 of the Australian Constitution. <laughs> That's so many sections. There are two ways in which a referendum starts. First, the House of Representatives and the Senate both pass an identical bill outlining the change in the wording of the Constitution that they want to put to a referendum. The next is called the deadlock provision. This is where the House of Representatives passes a bill, but then the Senate rejects it and then the House of Representatives passes the same bill three months later. And then they ask the Governor General to intervene and just sort of give it royal assent anyway. In 1914, the Governor General declined to submit bills passed in the Senate to the people because they can eventually act on the advice of the Prime Minister. Legally, they don't have to though. That's just what they do. Hypothetically, I guess the Senate could initiate a referendum because the Governor General doesn't always have to act on the advice of the, of the Prime Minister. Hypothetically speaking, a multi-millionaire could be watching this and be like, wow, I'm so impressed with how well you educate people about politics, David. Thank you for reading through all those dense and really boring Australian Parliament House website pages and summarizing things so well. Here, have a million dollars so you can finally afford a house. 
you know, hypothetically. Really though, we all know that it's never actually going to happen. Unless... The Governor General also doesn't have to approve a referendum, even if it passes in both houses. In 1965 and in 1983, despite a bill passing in both houses, the government advised the Governor General not to take it to a referendum. I don't know why, it's actually kind of hard to find information about that. The Governor General actually has quite a few powers, and I've made a video about that, so please check that out and then also subscribe if you haven't already. So, once the Governor General approves, the referendum is then brought to the public to vote on. They must have at least two months between when the bill is passed and when the vote happens, but it can also be no longer than six months to hold the vote. This gives the different sides to come up with different arguments, for or against. So the public is voting on them. How do they get one? with swords. No, here's the thing, it's not just a majority vote across all of Australia, it's a majority vote of the population and states. This is to avoid more populous states holding more sway than smaller ones. This can result in some referendums that get more than 50% or even more than 60% of the yes vote to still fail because it requires a, at least four out of six of the states to have a majority yes vote. We actually had a referendum about this specific thing in 1974, where we asked everyone, hey, should we change it so it only needs 50% of the states instead of four out of six? Spoilers, it didn't pass. You could argue that removing the state majority clause wouldn't actually affect the outcome of many referendums and so isn't that important to remove. Or you could say, I don't want the government to change things too easily. Furthermore, there's even extra provisions that if a state is specifically affected by that referendum, then that state must also have a majority yes if the referendum is to pass. Section 128 of the Constitution gives some examples of when this is relevant. So this involves things like if the result involves reducing the proportional representation of the state in Parliament, or if it reduces the minimum number of representatives that that state has in the House of Representatives, or it changes the boundaries of that state, or it changes the provisions of the Constitution specifically in relation to that state. So hypothetically, a referendum can have a majority yes on the national vote, as well as five out of six of the states voting in a majority yes, and it can still be blocked. But that requires extremely specific circumstances, and it's not really relevant. But it's like, if we wanted to vote that New South Wales was now half the size, we can't just do that. Like, Victoria and Queensland can't just, like, gang up on it and be like, you're tiny now. Like a pincer move. Uh, uh. That is just an extra precaution and honestly is not really relevant. But now you know a fun fact that you probably didn't know before. Bust that one out at a trivia night sometime. Impress your friends and family by starting conversations with, hey, did you know about the triple majority provision in constitutional referendums in regarding to state boundaries? <laughs> They'll love it. I guarantee everyone is going to be super interested in, in that. They're just going to be, they'll be super interested in that and they'll ask you to explain further. After all that criteria, it's actually then down to winning it. And actually the likelihood of that is pretty low. There have been 44 referendums as of this video. As I film this, there has actually been mention of introducing a referendum about recognition of Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander people in the constitution. So we'll see where that goes in the future. But out of those 44, only eight have succeeded in the past 118 years. So that's not the best odds. Since 1912, most referendums have been usually accompanied by informative pamphlets that are approved by a majority of the parliament who voted either yes or no on the bill. These pamphlets have arguments for or against the proposed changes. These arguments are to be no longer than 2,000 words. Note that I said usually, but not always, because there was no no pamphlet for the 1967 Aboriginal referendum. And thank goodness, because why would you say no to that? 
If multiple referendums are on the same day, an argument for a side may be longer than 2,000 words, so long as the average for all the different arguments is no more than 2,000. There are some criticisms of this pamphlet process. Professor Howard, former Dean of Melbourne Law School, wrote in his book Australia's Constitution that the yes vote is often presented simply and is similar to the words of what is being proposed, whereas the no vote pamphlet is designed merely to confuse and is a totally unreliable guide to what the amendment is about. An ill-informed no campaign that manipulates people and voters into not understanding the importance of a yes vote? Wow, that's just so hard. That's just that. I can't. Could you imagine? Same-sex marriage <coughs> postal survey. What? Um, historically, people haven't been in favour of changes of increasing government power. All 17 attempts by the Commonwealth to increase its economic powers have been rejected, and two referendums involving local government have also been rejected. There have been referendums on social powers which have passed, like the 1946 referendum on social services, and of course the historic 1967 referendum on Aboriginal Australians, both of which were successful. I'll get into successful referendums in just a moment. One argument as to why referendums often fail is that the average person hasn't got a very good understanding of what constitutional law is, and so therefore they don't really understand what effects that a change could have. Potentially then, voters could play it safe and leave things as it were. I mean, after all, how can you agree to change something if you don't have a complex understanding of it or really a strong opinion? If only there was some sort of like accessible online and kind of funny YouTube resource that could help people understand Australian politics. Huh. Of course, because this is politics, there is a counter argument. The Australian public has shown that it is capable of distinguishing between the requests of different referendums, and therefore having strongly different opinions about different questions. Multiple referendums are often actually held on the same day, and show different levels of support. For example, the government in 1967 wanted to piggyback off the support for the Aboriginal constitutional change, and decided to tack on another referendum where they wanted to make it so they could increase the amount of seats in the House of Representatives without necessarily increasing the amount of seats in the Senate. Mmm. Which, by the way, constitutionally, needs to be as practical as possible half the amount of the House of Representatives. It didn't work. And that referendum failed with only one state scraping by with a past 50% for a yes majority. Well, you may be thinking, what about people and territories though? They're not mentioned, are they? You haven't mentioned them at all thus far. Before 1977, they didn't count. They didn't matter. Screw them. Whatever. They're not that important. The 1977 referendum was a referendum on referendums. It asked, should territories be allowed to vote in referendums? Which is nice and meta. It allowed those in the Northern Territory, Australian Capital Territory, and External Territories to vote in referendums. And thankfully, a majority of all states decided, yes, of course, duh, they're Australians, why shouldn't they vote in referendums? Obviously. Though, Queensland, for some reason, had like the least amount of support. Only 59.58% of people were like, yeah, which is weird because why shouldn't people in the Northern Territory and ACT be allowed to vote? Does Queensland have some beef with Darwin? Is there like some historical feud that I am like missing out on? Like, am I unaware here? Look, let's, let's not dwell on it. Now people in the territories count towards the national vote, but don't affect the state majority. It's still down to the states whether things will pass or not. So, hey, territories, we kinda care about you. So let's talk about the successful referendums. So what has changed since 1901? And what has the majority of the public actually cared enough to be like, yeah, I'll allow that. Okay, so the following referendums have been successful. In 1906, senator terms were allowed to commence in July instead of January. It's not to give them a nice long holiday, it's because before that, the House of Representatives and the Senate elections didn't occur simultaneously. 
technically they still don't need to, we just do it sometimes out of convenience. In 1910, the federal government decided that it should be able to take over state debts. Beforehand, it could only take over pre-existing debts. Now it could take them over whenever. In 1928, Australia then revisited state debts and adds more amendments, I guess. Uh, thrilling, I know. Please don't get me to explain state finance amendments like this. Please. In 1946, the government was given the power to legislate on a wide range of social services. Previously, Section 51 of the Constitution said that the Australian government could legislate in terms of invalid or old age pensions, like maternity allowances, widow's pensions, child endowment, unemployment, pharmaceutical, sickness, and hospital benefits, medical and dental services, and benefits for students and family allowances, things we appreciate and benefit from to this day in one way or another. The government had actually sneakily tried to legislate on some of these things before that referendum, like widow's pensions in 1942 and child endowment payments in 1941. Child endowment, by the way, if you're wondering what that means, was a non-means-tested allowance to mothers for each child after the first, under the age of 16. It was replaced in 1976 by the family allowance. And in 1967, we passed the most famous referendum in Australian history. It is that one on the Aboriginal Australians. While many referendums fail, this one had a whopping record-breaking 90.77% yes. It allowed Indigenous Australians to be counted in the population, and it allowed the government to make specific laws regarding them. Because of the restrictions until 1977, only states were allowed to vote in referendums. So all the Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory weren't allowed to vote on this referendum that affected them directly. This is seen of having a large historical significance as it has allowed for greater participation in policy, higher levels of government spending in Indigenous affairs, and has enabled future legislation such as the Native Title Act of 1993, which was the result of Eddie Koiki Mabo's historic court case establishing native title. If you don't know who that is, he's an incredibly important Torres Strait Islander person, and I recommend either reading his biography or at very least his Wikipedia article. And in 1977, this was the year for passing referendums. We had four referendums and a plebiscite. And Australia was all like, and you get a majority vote, and you get a majority vote, and you get a majority vote. And making simultaneous elections of the Senate and House of Representatives? Uh, nah, let's keep that optional. Like, let's, let's not go there. But then, hey, they did also change the national anthem to what we know it now as Advanced Australia Fair. Like I said, in 1977, we passed the referendum on referendums that allowed territories to vote. We also allowed parties to fill casual vacancies in the Senate by another member of that party. If a Senate seat is made vacant through either disqualification, resignation, or death, we usually now just pick the next candidate down the party ticket for the Senate ballot. Before that, the government didn't actually need to have someone replace that seat. And if they did have a replacement, it didn't actually have to be from that party at all. And the term ended whenever the next general election was, even if that term was originally meant to go on for another three years. This old system meant that, you know, potentially the balance of power could shift mid-term. So we fixed that, basically. And the third referendum that passed was about the retiring ages of federal judges. Now they retire at age 70. Before this, they had tenure for life, which unfortunately meant that we had to forcibly retire them due to, like, ill health. Making them retire at 70 fixed this issue, but it also only applied to those after 1977, so some judges were allowed to continue serving late into their 80s. And that was the last time we had a successful referendum. Yes, that was over 40 years ago. Referendums don't actually happen that often, and when they do, sometimes they are lumped together. In 1984, we had two referendums. In 1988, we had four. And in 1999, we had two. We asked Australia if we wanted to become a republic and leave the Commonwealth. 
and we also wanted to change the preamble of the constitution. Both were rejected. And in 99 was the last time we even had a referendum. Fun fact, John Howard actually wanted the word mateship to be included in the constitutional preamble because he loves that word. We could have had the word mateship enshrined in the highest legal document of Australia. Struth, mate. That would have been bloody grouse, eh? Alas, that didn't come to be. Well, there you have it. To recap, referendums are the legal way in which our country democratically tells the government whether or not to change parts of the constitution. So thank you very much for watching yet another episode of Ozpol Explained. As always, there are resources in the description which could help you for any further reading you would like to do or if you want resources and citations for any assignments you are doing. Please share this video so others can learn. Uh, don't forget to comment down below what you would like to learn about next and also subscribe. And if you're feeling extra generous, there is a Patreon link in the description where you can support free educational content. Goodbye.